When managing cardiac arrest, we must try to identify and treat the underlying cause. Otherwise, we are just doing CPR all day. Most clinicians will be familiar with the four H's and four T's, but wait, aren't there five of each? Just when you think you've got your head round them, some bright Dutch people then add in five C's. So what's going on? Let's take a look at the causes of cardiac arrest and what we can do about them. Now remember when someone has a cardiac arrest and you start CPR, that doesn't usually fix things on its own. CPR is delivering oxygen to the lungs and circulating that oxygen around the body to keep the heart and brain alive while you treat the problem that caused the cardiac arrest in the first place. Sometimes that problem is a rhythm disturbance and you defibrillate and you save the patient's life. But once we're in non-shockable rhythm territory, or the defibrillation hasn't worked, we need to figure out what's going on and treat that, or the patient dies. One way to generate a list of possible reversible causes is to go through the H's and T's, and the four H's and four T's of the European Resuscitation Council are shown right here. And you can see they've grouped acute myocardial infarction and pulmonary embolism under the same T, thrombosis right here. The AHA guidelines separate them so that they have five, not four T's. To balance the books, they've added in another H, hydrogen ions, suggesting acidosis is a cause of cardiac arrest. I'd love to debate that right now, but not in this video. So with this apparently comprehensive list, why would we add in a bunch of C's? What is going on there? I'm going to cover that and the H's and the T's, but first let's consider an important concept. Causes of cardiac arrest can be cardiac or non-cardiac. And when we consider the cardiac causes, the AHA has a nice way of categorizing the cardiac causes, primary ischemic, primary structural, and primary electrical. Let's see where the H's and T's fit into this model because some fit into it and some don't. You've got thrombosis coronary as primary ischemic and thrombosis pulmonary as primary structural. Tamponade goes into structural as well. Toxins go into primary electrical. And hyper or hypokalemia and other metabolic causes go into primary electrical. But some causes listed here are not included in the H's and T's. Like some structural causes such as cardiomyopathies and congenital issues like anomalous coronary arteries and inherited electrical disorders like Brugada and Wolf-Parkinson-White. And we even have blunt myocardial injury here in the form of commotio cordis, which we'll come back to. Let's consider the H's and T's in the non-cardiac causes. They include T for tension pneumothorax, H for hypovolemia. We're pointing to somewhere in the abdomen there because we could be bleeding. And hypothermia. But there are other non-cardiac causes of arrest, like intracranial hemorrhage. In particular, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, to be fair to the resuscitation organizations, the point of the H's and T's is to identify reversible causes. So you can see why something like intracranial hemorrhage is not included. But these causes are still important. For example, there are many examples of patients who are in arrest or post arrest going to cath lab who have had massive intracranial bleeds. If we'd considered this, it might have saved a trip to the cath lab and potentially prevented anticoagulant and antiplatelet medications being given. So that brings us on to the C's, invented by doctors Mommers and Slacht, who come from the Netherlands. They've taken the H's and T's and added in five brand new shiny C's to make cardiac arrest more interesting. Let's go through those C's. We have cerebral causes, especially acute subarachnoid hemorrhage, because that's known that it can present with serious ECG abnormalities. It can cause cardiac arrest with non-shockable and even sometimes shockable rhythms. Cardiomyopathy is listed as potentially infectious, dilated, hypertrophic, and this is important because it can capture some of the structural causes, but also acute infectious causes, which I think they mean to include myocarditis. Now, myocarditis isn't a rapidly reversible cause, but with time it is reversible. So considering this might lead you to consider the patient to be a candidate for extracorporeal therapy, ECMO, if that's an option where you work, or if you're considering it, and you're a pre-hospital provider, it could lead you to take the patient with ongoing CPR to a center with ECMO capability. Conduction abnormalities, 
And here the authors mention those that result in ventricular arrhythmias like Brugada syndrome and long QT syndrome because they're well-known causes for sudden cardiac death. But some of these are repolarization disorders. And under the heading of pure conduction abnormalities, I think one should also consider heart block with ventricular standstill. I'll talk about this in another video, but look at this ECG trace. You've got P waves, P waves, P waves, P waves with no ventricular complexes. This is ventricular standstill. If you can capture this early enough in a patient that appears to be presenting with a systole, they often respond really well to pacing. This is a true conduction abnormality. And in asystole, where otherwise you'd be doing CPR and giving adrenaline, if you get successful pacing, you're going from a crap low flow state from chest compressions to a potentially normal cardiac output and a life saved with transcutaneous pacing. So thinking of conduction abnormalities is so important. When we look at congenital abnormalities, which can include structural heart disease, valvular heart disease, coronary artery anomalies, sometimes they are known about and they've been corrected through surgery. But in younger patients, their first presentation of a congenital problem might be as cardiac arrest. Commotio cordis is one of the commonest causes of sudden cardiac death in young athletes after hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and congenital coronary artery anomalies, which come under two of the other proposed Cs. Commotio cordis is when a blow to the chest causes a lethal dysrhythmia. And a recent high-profile case was American footballer Damar Hamlin, who happily made a full recovery thanks to immediate resuscitation. So that's the five Cs. But to even things up in the European numbers, we need five Ts and five Hs to make it five of everything. So they split thrombosis coronary and thrombosis pulmonary, just like in the American guidelines, so that you've got five Ts. And then for the Hs, to make it five, they haven't added hydrogen ions, but they've introduced a new H, hypoglycemia. Now, I used to be skeptical of including this as a cause of cardiac arrest, but I have looked at the literature now, and there is a recognized incidence of young type 1 diabetic patients being found dead in bed, thought to be due to hypoglycemia, possibly mediated by a massive sympathoadrenal response affecting the heart. Rat studies show that once glucose levels in the brain reach a critical low level, there is adrenal stimulation leading to QT prolongation, some dysrhythmia, heart block, and then terminal bradycardia. And this can be completely prevented by adrenergic blockers. So it does seem to be a sympathetic cerebrocardiac phenomenon, perhaps a bit like what you get with subarachnoid hemorrhage. So it does seem reasonable to me to include hypoglycemia as one of the H's. So there you have five C's and another H. So now it's even harder to run through your causes of arrest in real time under pressure. Do I apply this in my practice? Absolutely not. I've yet to see this being applied intelligently during a cardiac arrest. What you sometimes see is someone coming in having been run over by a bus and they go into traumatic cardiac arrest and someone says, let's go through the H's and T's, everybody. Hypothermia, um, hypokalemia. And I say to them, dude, they've been run over by a bus. I promise you this is not hypothermia. And what would make this about the potassium, man? Come on. So as a list of causes, H's and T's are fine. And the five C's will add some additional important ones. The H's and T's will cover a lot of important cardiac and non-cardiac causes of arrest. And the addition of five C's and one H will help us think of some additional easily missed cardiac as well as non-cardiac causes. The H's, T's and C's can serve you well as an unstructured list of causes of cardiac arrest that you can spew out in an advanced cardiac life support exam. But as a heat of the moment mnemonic tool to guide therapy, I think they are sometimes misapplied and I prefer to employ an alternative approach. But that, my friends, is for another video. The important thing to remember is that basic life support, CPR, is just the temporizing organ support to provide some very limited perfusion to the heart and brain. And your plan when setting up to manage a cardiac arrest should always include what you're going to do to identify and treat the underlying cause. And here, the H's, T's and C's can act as a useful cognitive aid so you don't miss some important ones that you otherwise 
might not think about. Let me know what you think of the H's and T's and whether the C's will help you with your patients. Do you think hypoglycemia is a cause we should think about and rule out? Are there any other important and treatable causes of cardiac arrest that are still being missed, even with the H's, T's and C's? I'd love to hear from you. You will find full text links to the articles discussed in the video description below. Until next time, thanks for watching.